So we are doing something very different today for the sermon, which I think is going to be good. Um, I, so we've been going through a lot about marriage for the last seven weeks. It's been really good. This is the, this is the final week. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to interview couples. Now, here's what I've realized um, from our marriage studies. I don't know if y'all remember the week that I talked on communication. Um, do you remember the pink and blue um, sunglasses and headphones? You got a lot of blue um, sunglasses and headphones, okay? And, you know, I've, some of you have gone to my wife and have said, when are you going to have your chance in the sun? Never. I'm just kidding. No, um, no. but today what I, what I, what I think is important, because you're all hitting on an important fact and an important statement, is in marriage, it, I, last I checked, um, it, it was the two become one flesh, right? And so to do that, if we're going to really um, talk about marriage, then I think we need to have a conversation from both perspectives. So what we're going to do is I've given, so this isn't a sermon per se, this is an interview. So I gave the questions out about two months ago in January. I looked back to make sure if I was being a bad preacher or not. I was not. Um, so we're going to, inter I'm going to be interviewing, um, four couples. Um, we've got, we've got ranges from those. I think Jason and Asya, y'all have been married. What? Well, you're telling me in a minute, one year, one year, all the way up to, are we at 52 in April? Okay. So we've got some experience that is going to be on stage with us this morning. And so please um, sit down, listen to this, because I think there are some things that we can all learn from these couples um, to better our marriages. Because how many of you guys want to have a better marriage? I am kind of scared. Um, husbands, you need to raise your hand, all right? <laughs> because that should be the goal. We all want better marriages. So if you are one of my couples, if you'll please come on up to, sta up to the stage, um, that'll be... That'll be great. Right over here, right over here. Please come. Yeah, these two. All right. Okay, first off, thank you all for being willing to say yes. I know it's terrifying to, to speak in front of people, so thank you um, for all doing this. Um, so the first question that, that I had for y'all um, is, number one, um, I'd like for you guys to introduce yourselves, you know, um, tell us your name and, and how long you guys have been married. I think that would be a great place to start. So... We are Jason and Asya Wilson. We uh, have been married one and three quarters of a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be two years in June. And um, what else is there? Uh, that's good. That's good? All right. All right. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Ryan, and this is Kara Franza. Kara. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to let her speak, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we've been married 11 years. Going on, we'll be 12 in December. That's amazing. So my name is Teddy Carrasco, my wife. Irma Carrasco. And we're going on 33 years this August. Wow. I'm Roger, and this is Pat Young, and we have been married 52 years come April 2nd, so we were not April fools. Uh, just clear that up. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys. All right, I'm going to start out easy with you, for, with you guys. How did you know your spouse was the one? Yeah, whoever wants to answer, you can just you can just raise your mic and so we can see. Okay, go ahead. So I don't have a, I wasn't grown up in the church, and so whenever I saw her, she had this amazing light. She had this fire desire for God. And before I knew it, 
she wanted, she was going to be the last person I saw at night. And I couldn't wait for her to be the first person I saw the next day. And I knew that it hurt to breathe without her. And so I needed to, I needed her to be a part of my life. And she introduced me to God and I needed God to be a part of me too. Wow, that's amazing. Go ahead, Jason. So me and Asia have known each other growing up through the church ever since she was adopted by Dave and Liz Winterode. And I, she had always said that she had liked me for that entire duration of time, and I, and I was a foolish guy who never, <laughs> who never knew that she had those feelings for me until eventually in high school I started to feel the same way. And then I remember we, we started dating, and maybe three years into that, I remember coming home one night and telling my parents, that I think she's the person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. Wow. So if you didn't pick up, ladies, um, we don't take cues, okay? <laughs> We're just not, I don't know what it is, we just miss it. So you got to let us know. Go ahead, Roger. Well, Pat and I grew up in the northeast Texas, about 20 miles apart. I was raised on a farm as a country boy, and... Uh, my senior year in high school, I went to work at a grocery store in a town about 20 miles away. Then right across the street, she was working at Bud's Drive-In, one of the best hamburger places you could get. <laughs> and uh, we met each other because all of us boys would run over there and get a quick bite to eat and on a break. And uh, that's where we met. And, you know, we had an immediate attraction to one another. But as we got to know each other, it was amazing the things we had in similarity and and uh, family, the way the way our families were, um, and knowing extended family, uh, we we had a lot of a lot in common, and it just wasn't any doubt. She was the one, and uh, uh, I wasn't going to turn loose. Wow. So me and Kara met, I was just out of college and she was in college and uh, we met at a concert, but so we weren't, we weren't in a serious dating relationship when we st first met, but the moment that I knew was when other opportunities for dates or dates occurred, I, no, I realized no, that, that she was the one that I wanted to go after and uh, asked her to be my girlfriend, and I'll let her tell the rest of the story because she does it better than me. <laughs> he likes the challenge. No. <laughs> when he did ask me to be his girlfriend, I, I, it took me a week to answer him. I told him I had to think about it because that was a serious commitment for me. So <laughs> he asked me on Sunday morning. He picked me up in his dirty, dirty, dirty truck where he had to lay a towel down for me, which didn't bother me. And uh, he asked me if I'd be his girlfriend. I looked at him and I said, I got to think about this. I'll get back to you. And he was <laughs> dumbfounded. But I committed and here we are. Wow. Okay. Now let's, now we're going to get in the nitty gritty. Okay. So, uh, how have you worked to become a better communicator within your marriage, or how are you working to become a better communicator? And for those of you who have been married for a while, what are also some tips that you might give to somebody who's working on communication within their marriage or their relationships that they're in right now? I always try to let him know what I'm thinking. Yeah. Because I want him to think about something, I might say, hey, I'm thinking about this, what do you think? Yeah. You know, and I follow up because he forgets. And I follow up again, and I'm like, hey, remember we talked about this? Oh, yeah, well, what do you think? Well, I don't know. Okay, well, think about that. And I have to constantly be sometimes reminding him. Yeah. And that frustrates me a little, but, not, but it's better than um, <clears throat> not even talking about and me making a final decision. Yeah. Because I like for us to make our decisions together. Absolutely. And I think that's that's also important. You know, in your marriages, you guys need to be working together to make, you know, those final decisions together. Because um, 
sometimes communicating and overly communicating. I know in ministry, I, I, would, I have to explain this to you. When I would do youth ministry, I would, I would send out a group me text that had all the parents in it. Um, I would email them. And then there would be something in the bulletin. And then we'd finally announce it in church. They would come in. Why is this not? Why is this the first time I'm hearing about it? It's like, well, did you get the group meet? Did you get the email? Did you see the bulletin? Did you check the website post? You know, and so, so it's always communicating and communicate and communicate and overly communicate. And I think it's the same way in our marriages as well. Um, sometimes I wish Camille would give me, when she, if I ever have to go to the grocery store, she'd give me pictures. That would be good. <laughs> go ahead, Roger. Well, God gave us two ears and one mouth. And Darian and I have a similar situation like you do. Mine is loud. Yeah. Yeah. And so really the, the most important thing about communicating in any relationship, but especially in your marriage, is learning how to listen. And it, it took me a while, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it took a while to, to learn how to really listen because most of the time whenever we're having a discussion, especially if it's an elevated discussion, we're thinking about what we're going to say back. We're not mm -hmm. thinking about what the other person is saying. So learning how to really listen and understand what's being communicated is key and your communication needs and skills will change every year yeah i mean it it's a continuous process so don't think you've mastered the communication thing yet it you're still working on it yeah no absolutely one thing i've really um the past i would say past four or five years I've been really working on. I had a mentor um, tell me once, he said, Darian, you do a lot of talking. Did you hear what I said? And, and, but really that made me start thinking is maybe what I need to start doing more of is listening. And, and, and I think you're right. And sometimes, you know, I'm still working on it. I'm a work in progress, but it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to listen. Um, and if we and for me, if I tell myself, okay, I'm going to spend time right now being the best listener I can be, I can sometimes have a better response and, a, and can usually have, a, you, I think the outcome comes out a little better, usually. Uh, I got to tell you all something. So this morning, I'm running downstairs and he's, this has been the number one question since day one when he sent this to us that I was most worried about because communication is absolutely difficult, especially when you're a woman and a man. And like you said, you guys can't read our minds, which I don't understand. I have a lot of questions for God when I get up there, <laughs> if I get up there. But this morning Ryan asked me, he's like, how have we grown in our communication or how have we bettered it? And I looked at him and I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that later. I don't know because it is a hard one. Um, I think it's taking... I mean, countless minutes of silence where I have to pray and ask God to soften my heart and open my eyes and my ears sometimes and try to empathize and understand where he's coming from because a lot of the time he works so much and he's caught up in his mind on what he's doing on the farm that he's occupied a lot of the time. And so I feel like I go unheard which can be really separating for us at times. And then it quiets me. And if you know me, I am not quiet. So that has been a hard one for us to grow in, but we are getting better. And um, like Darian just said, you know, having, having listening ears um, is so crucial as a husband and a wife because we both need to be, under, be able to... Um, understand one another and empathize with one another the best we can and not always offer a solution but just sometimes listen and love and support is all we need sure <laughs> i'm a work in progress <laughs> amen brother <laughs> so in uh in mine and Asia's relationship as we've grown and learned how each of us has our quirks and understanding. Um, one way that we've tried and continue to try to work on communicating is um, whenever I get home, usually when we're eating dinner, we put all our phones and electronics away and we'll just talk. And that seems to have improved our communication a, 
at least a little bit more than what it was previously when I get home and I just go and play my video games or whatever kind of thing and she'd get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things where we just kind of have to listen and allow each other to speak their minds and, and just work towards understanding each other, whatever it takes. Yeah. So I, I, think, I think anybody who's ever been married, maybe Mike can understand this to some point, but when you got married, you probably expected marriage to be a certain way. Um, and, and, and how have you handled the unexpected or the expected in your marriage? We made a lot of phone calls to Ned and Phyllis <laughs> in the beginning of our marriage. Not only because they, Ned married us, but because they have been some of the greatest mentors in our life when it comes to living out God's word and walking it and talking it. Um, they should be up here and not us, but um, we love you. <laughs> Sorry. But anyways, um, for me, I had this expectation that I was going to have this husband that would take out the trash and, you know, be uh, available emotionally. <laughs> and when we first got married, I asked him, I was like, hey, we take the trash out. He said, that's the woman's job. I tell you what, guys, I almost lost. <laughs> I was like, what you talking about? That was never said. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> but, he, but anyway, so it's, it has a lot to do with how you're raised. So what I'm trying to say, though, is expectations are a lie, I feel like. The only expectation I have is for this man to lead our family in a godly manner and be completely devoted to me in our marriage as far as faithfulness and love. Um, I think to put any other expectations on a person can be unfair. And I think you tend to fail a lot more if you do have high expectations of one another. Yeah. You know, um, Camille's still training me to, <laughs> to be cleanly. I, I mean, I always tell her, you know, I'll have a coffee cup at the computer. I'm like, I was going to take that. And she's like, when, next week? I'm like, no, next month. <laughs> but I was going to get to it. No, but no, I, I, I understand. I'm, Camille's training me right now. It'll happen. When we were first married, the things we would argue about was who had the remote control first. And you get to watch what you want. And... <laughs> eating up all the ice cream. And those little things became big things. Yeah. They were dumb, but they became very big things. And I just remember having to constantly compromise at first. Mm -hmm. I was always having to compromise, and I just thought, I grew up in a family of 10 kids. I was one of the younger ones. The pecking order, I was at the bottom. I always had to compromise. I thought it was going to be a little different. I thought I was going to have a little more control. Um, that was a lie. <laughs> and, um, you know, we've been married 32 years. The first two years of our marriage were so hard. And I share this story because we were fighting about clothes being thrown on the floor. Um, you know, um, you know, you drank all of this and you eat all the food all the time, dumb things like that. And I'm going to say that we, our elders at church noticed that I would be sitting in one spot, he would be sitting in another. And I'll never forget that those three men came to our house and knocked on our door. And they said to us, I was so embarrassed. Oh, my goodness. I thought we were faking it really good at church. And... Um, Floyd Robertson, Ed Young, and Harry Peacock came to our house, and they told us we wouldn't. It is our job as shepherds to intervene. We're seeing something going on here, and I'm so grateful to those men. Uh, Floyd is now passed on, but I remember just being so embarrassed at first, and I I have to tell you that. Our church had a lot to do with helping our marriage grow. Being part of a church family is very important. And I'm just grateful because I was 22 and Teddy was 23. And we both had come from broken homes. And we had a lot of beautiful examples in our congregation of very strong marriages. 
Yeah, but I think sometimes it helps helps to have somebody else come in and put things in perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think you know when we can when we can take a step back and look at whatever may be going on. Um, and this is going to segue nicely here into another question here in a second. But when we can have somebody to help us put things into perspective, we then can look at back and say, why are we even fighting over this? Camille and I were we were driving into church this morning and. And we were laughing at the stupid things that we have fought over. Um, I was, I had, I'm going to pick on you for a moment. We were, I got to spend Monday in the tractor with Ryan. And we were, we were talking and he said, you know, some of the things we would get in these huge arguments over. He, he said, you know, it, it was like he had cheated on something, but it was only clothes on the floor. Um, you know, when we can take a moment and we can step back and look at things in perspective, it's interesting how quickly we can laugh at those things, and then maybe if we take a moment, I don't know, this is just me guessing, uh, if we can take a moment and think about these things before we start you know, going at it, we can stop and say, is this really worth it? Is this hill really worth dying on? And, and I think sometimes in marriages, what, I, what I've seen and what I've observed is we think every hill is worth dying on, and that's not true. I think we should, we should talk about our feelings and what we think about these things, but not every hill is worth dying on. And I think that's important. But leading into the next conversation uh, um, topic, um, what have you found to be the healthiest way to handle conflict within your marriage? Or how are you working to implement handling conflict within your marriage? Okay, let's go Jason, then Roger. Oh, I'm dropping. So, yeah, like... It really depends on the situation for us. If it's something that we know that we can sit down and discuss without getting mad at each other, usually we'll we'll try to do that, but sometimes it it can sometimes blow up and we have to give each other just a little bit of time to cool off. Yeah. And then from that, try to get back and discuss it. We try and our goal is usually to try to discuss it before the night ends, kind of thing. So we don't go to sleep mad because I found that if you do that, it usually persists throughout the week. <laughs> yeah, so you're right. Sometimes taking a little bit of time to process, but don't let it go on for, for days because then it grows. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Go ahead, Roger. Well, conflict happens, that's for sure. And uh, especially raising boys and things that they do. But one of the one of the things that, that helped us was that we had we had great people that we looked up to that had yeah. great marriages. We had great examples, but but in conflict, um, one of the things that's real important that you make sure about those conflicts is to keep them personal. You you don't want to share with your girlfriend at work, or your, you don't want to call your mother and tell her everything that he's doing. You you don't. You know, because when when your spouse does something you're angry about and you share that with people, that's all they remember. Yeah. They don't remember the fact that you resolve that 30 minutes later. Yeah. And, and you still love each other. And so they're going to remember the negative things. You, so never share negative things about your spouse. Yeah. With anybody. And, um, you know, it, it's, just, it's just keeping yourself committed to each other and we were both committed to God before we were committed to each other yeah I can't stress how important that is that when you choose a person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with you want to choose someone that's going to help you get to heaven yeah and that's that's really critical you want to add anything to that But no, I think um, one of the, I remember I was talking with a friend, he'd, he'd got married and he was, and we were talking about it because he was frustrated. Um, his spouse would, would, would um, they'd have an argument and the first thing she would do is go tell her parents. And then he's, you know, he's like, the hard thing about that, Darian, is that when you do that, um, that's all they're ever going to see you as is, well, you hurt my baby. And, and, you're, and Roger's right, you know, 30 minutes later, you may have resolved that. But, you know, the hardest thing, that, the worst thing that I think we can do in our marriages at times is to go in and, and, 
and sometimes share those things that maybe don't necessarily, that, that may have been resolved and things like that. Because when we talk negatively about our spouse, Roger's right, people are only going to see you as that negative thing. And that may not be who you are. Um, so absolutely. And you know, there, there could be times in your marriage that you need counseling yes. together. You, you may need to ask for help in resolution of something, but that's different than going and just spreading gossip about your spouse. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for clarifying so don't, that. Don't hesitate to ask for help, you know, whether it's whether it's a, a, a couple that you can, can mentor you yeah. or whether it be actually a professional that's trained in counseling. Don't, don't ever not look for an opportunity to way to help you through things because life does bring things that are difficult. Yeah. And you don't always have the answer. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so how have you worked, um, how have you worked and how are you working to make and continue to make God the center of your marriage? Go ahead, Rob. So go to clarify, by the way, the whole trash thing, the woman trash thing. <laughs> this was more of a butt chewing of, hey, you never take out the trash. And uh, not, honey, will you please take out the trash? Sure, honey. So let's put this in context. So the <laughs> no, this goes into what I'm saying. It, it goes into the submitting to one another and, and what Darian asked about keeping God the center. So men and women speak completely different languages. And what, what, that's the only thing we've had going. I mean, our marriage is a testament to the power of God because there is no way we should still be married with yeah. <laughs> the struggles and trials we've went through. And they're not huge struggles, but, I mean, we're just two imperfect, different people that have had, without God at the center, would have been impossible to stay together through all of it. But um, in submitting to one another, and our, our communication styles are different. You know, Kara's very talkative. She's... And I, I am talkative when it comes, you know, to the two F's, farming and football. <laughs> Ask Rory. We talk all the time. It doesn't always have to be farming, but I'm, ta I'm talkative in my own area and with my own area. Of, but, I mean, Kara's just very outgoing with everybody and with every conversation. And before, right before Darian called on me, she bumped me, you're not talking. <laughs> so she's always wanting me to talk more, and I like being quiet. I, you know, I can have a quiet word. So there's differences. But in submitting to one another... Um, the main thing is just kindness. Yeah, kindness goes a long way. And and we, one person says something that's not quite kind. Well, the when it comes to the conflict, the next person says something to top that, to fire that off. And then before you know it, it's ten levels high. And yeah, no one. Sorry, no one wants to be. They it gets out of control rapidly. So it takes it takes. Uh, Letting your pride is the big thing. Yeah. And pride is something that God detests. Have any of you guys ever gotten in an argument with your spouse and then by the time you're done, you don't even remember what you were arguing about, but you're mad at them? Okay. I, 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 I feel that, you know, and, and then you go back and you think about it and it's just, yeah, perspective. Absolutely. What else? How have you guys kept God the center? Go ahead. So I think once we start growing, you start looking at each other a little bit different. If God gave her to me, it's God's gift that's with me. <clears throat> and so when I look at her, you know, I, I really got to look at God through her. And really, that's who I'm attacking. Um, so the value system of what somebody's worth dictates how you're going to talk to them. And it goes right back down to our weaknesses of communication. I am somebody that will think about it, will ponder it, will not want to deal with it right on the moment. And Irma, she's very expressive, very, let's take care of this now. And it could escalate fast. 
And so we've learned to communicate in a way where it benefits us, where we are using our strengths. And sometimes it's okay to be quiet and take it and listen. And then again, maybe a day later, come back to it and say, okay, now let's talk. So to hinder a person's strength in the moment of an argument, it's not the right time. To try to make somebody be speak when their personality is quiet, it's not the right time. So between the two working together, just always think of God's gift is right across you. And don't say the words that could hurt, that could really tear down. Just listen and let them express. And then at the, fine, at the moment where you finally are at a speaking level, then you start talking about what you need to talk about. Yeah, you know, trying to really live out the fruits of the spirit within those moments um, and working through conflict with, with those in mind. Um, that absolutely. So how, how else have you guys worked to keep God the center of your marriage? What does that look like in your life? Go ahead, Jason. So it's for us, it's been a work in progress. We've, yeah. uh, I think at the start, we had our own ways of doing things and we kind of had to figure out how do we work together to put God at the center. And, and, it's, and we're still learning and we're still trying to grow. And I think um, most recently, what Asya has been doing is listening to sermons and lessons online. And when I get back home, usually we discuss it and talk about it. And from there, we're able to look further into the word or look up something that might help us both to grow in that day. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to find things to keep you fed, you know, whether that's sermons or Bible study and things like that. Absolutely. What else? What do you... I'm going to pick on you guys for a moment. What what have you what have what are, what have you and Pat done, Roger, through the years? Well, like I said from the very beginning, we were both committed yeah. to God, and um, early in our marriage, you know, I was working and we were working with a youth group. We were in part of a youth group, and then we were the first ones that got married out of that youth group, and it just kept growing. But but we entered into that marriage committed. We were becoming one, and we would never not be one. Yeah. And and um, so as, as you resolve conflicts and, and you raise kids, you know, we each had our strengths in that. I mean, as we, we grew into knowing what our roles were. Yeah. You know, we, we identified our roles, and we lived up to those roles. And... I can tell you, we, we wouldn't have made it without her <laughs> yeah. doing what she did and and keeping us close, keeping God in the center of our marriage was really what pulled us together. Yeah. And it, uh, she was great at raising children and keeping the home and and, and make, making life easier for me. You know, I, I was working. I, she, she did everything she could that when I got home from work and work was over, we had family. Yeah. And um, it just, it grows from that, and it continues to grow from that. And, you know, now that we're retired and we don't go see other people and we just get up and look at each other all day, every day, <laughs> it's gotten a little difficult, I can tell you. <laughs> we, we spent more time in the last two years together than we probably had in the last 20, but but uh, um, but it's it's really... It's really being committed to God first, and then you help each other in that growth of being a Christian, and then you grow together. For sure. You know, and you brought up a good point. You know, um, in marriage, there's, there's different seasons, right? Um, there's, there's different stages, so to speak. And so I want to I spend some time and, and talk about those stages. And, and so... I, the the first question I have for that is how have you worked together as a team in raising children, or how are you working together as a team to raise children? I guess it's us <laughs> right now. Um, 
So when you say seasons in marriage, I literally refer to farming because I don't really see him February to April because he's planting or he's prepping ground and getting everything ready. Um, and then harvest comes and I don't see him for another three months. So sometimes I feel like a single mom um, running a marathon that I feel like I'm constantly losing. But I know that he will, when he can, he'll be a part of that run with me in that marathon. And I know that he's doing his best while he's at work too. Um, but I think our strongest attribute in this marriage is raising our children because we are very like-minded when it comes to them, when it comes to um, encouraging them, when it comes to um, um, correction, punishment. We stand in agreement with everything. I, I really do think that is our strongest attribute. What do you say? Well, Ryan. Yes, first and foremost, instilling uh, the Spirit of God and the fear of God into them. Well, yeah. <laughs> we agree on that. <laughs> one thing that I think, um, one thing I'd like, if you remember, to share, though, is, you know, one of the conversations we had on Monday, I thought was was really good, because you are busy. You know, I was I was shocked we were sitting in the, I got to sit in the in the side seat. I felt like I was, I was like Robin and he was Batman, but... Um, <laughs> But, you know, we were, he was sharing with me, um, you know, first off, the guy's crazy. They were going to work to like 1030 at night. But, um, but no, there was something you said that really stood out to me, especially in the seasons. It was, you know, you're not going to be able to make it to everything, but you do your best to be there at at least 90% of everything. And I, and I think that's, I think that was huge. Can you, can you talk on that just a little bit? So during the, during the rough times, like you kind of, there's things that, you know, you just, I'm going to be there because I'm going to be there for this. Yeah. But I might not be there for the 4-H meeting where we're sitting there for two, three hours while a bunch of kids have, I mean, yes, it's it's good for the kids. And yes, I would love to be there. And if I'm off, I can go for it, go to that. So there, there's priority things, you know. Um, I won't be able to be there for 100% of the things, but I'm going to be there for 90% of them. And the tractors have lights, so I can go do those things and get back on the tractor after. So it's a balance, and it's a hard balance to find. Um, during when it's not the busy seasons, I'm there nearly 100% of the time. Yeah. Lord willing. But And I wasn't always that way before, you know, especially before the bout with COVID. I was always finding a way. Nope, can't do it. Got to work. Got to work. Not going to be there. Nope, not going to be there for that. And it, you know, it woke me up. And then woke me up how old my kids were getting and how precious time is. So, absolutely. And and I, I bring that up because it's so easy in life to get busy with our work, right? Every everybody here has is has worked or had a job in some way or some form or fashion, and and the next thing you know is you know you've spent all your life working, and you have missed your children. And so I I really wanted I really wanted you to share that because. I think it is important. Any any time that we can make to be there and be present is important. And I think they remember that. They'll remember that forever. Absolutely. Go ahead, Teddy. So one of the things that we did is we always team worked. If one child said something, we always talked to each other before we made a decision because we never allowed them to play the parents. And yeah, they tried. Yeah. <laughs> um, but one point that I wanted to add for sure was I have a lot of friends that the kids became the center of everything. And what happened is when the kids grew up, the parents forgot to be each other's center. And when the kids left the house, they dissolved in the marriage. And so at the same time that you're feeding the kids, all the, the spiritual stuff, the physical needs, everything that you're doing, got to remember to keep your spouse to be in there somewhere on your date night, on your talking to each other, on something. Because the kids, they're only lent to us for a little while, and they will move away. And we need to have that support with the, the parents. Um, all through it so that the love does not dissolve and does not disappear when the kids grow up. But we pray as a family, we pray together growing up 
and we still pray every day. And our kids are number one on that list. Um, God, take care of these kids because the world is mean. The world can be ugly and it will pull. So we instill, hopefully, their own faith in what they have. It's not their parents' faith. They have to own it. And when we teach them, we have to put that in them. This is what you believe. This is what you need to study. This is what you need to own. And when they leave, it's over. You have it in you, and it's going to continue, and it's up to you. Okay. Um, we're, thank you for that. I'm going to try and get three more questions in, all right? So bear with me, guys. But uh, there's one more question. How has your marriage adapted once the kids have left or are leaving the house? Um, Teddy and I were married for about seven years before we had Javier. Yeah. So I kind of feel that we're back to that. The only difference is when we were younger and we were by ourselves, we were doing everything. Now we get home and I'm like, I'm tired, so am I. So we watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were going to be doing all kinds of fun stuff. You're, uh, we're older and I get tired. I mean, I'm not saying we're that old, but we are tired, mentally tired from work. Yeah. And um, I think we spend, we're spending more time with each other again. Oh, good. And, and that is my favorite thing. Uh, I, the love language, I am that person that likes time uh, with him. And he's my best friend. So I love spending time with him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, and I don't know if this is true. I'm not there yet. I'm getting close. Um, in a few weeks, I'll be 30. So it's all downhill from here, I've been told. But um, is it true at 9 p.m. Um, you turn into a pumpkin and, and you're done? That's what my grandmother used to say. And so you're just tired and exhausted. We are night owls. so That's fair. We, so it's not true. No. No. Okay. Okay. Roger, Pat, do you all have anything to add to that? Well, we haven't experienced that yet. We, uh, we raised three boys, and just about the time the last one left, we got another one to raise, and he's still with us, so we're, we'll let you know when that happens. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about seasons, um, and, 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 you know, we've, I, I was trying to do quickly do a mental math um, am, am I right? We've got over, what, 80 years of marriage experience on this stage right now. Um, and, and in that 80 years and the different st seasons that you guys have all have gone through, I think there's been moments where we've grown and, and maybe we've I w I changed in some ways. Um, and I think that's just part of life. But, but how have you, as you've gone through these seasons... How has anticipating each other's needs changed during your marriage? Go ahead. Well, the first thing, Pat and I married young. We had children young. Yeah. Uh, but she was able to be a stay-at-home mom until all of our kids were in school and, and older. And, you know, she did things like when I, our first one was probably a year old, I'd get off work at 2 a.m. and go home. She'd have a full meal sitting on the table at 2 a.m. Wow. Yeah. Uh, amazing things that we learned early on. I mean, it, so meeting each other's needs obviously change. And, and when you have young children and then they become teenagers and then they hit that college age, your needs change and the needs of the family change. Yeah. And so it's, it's constant change is what you're dealing with. And you have to be willing to... to pay attention to each other as those needs change. Okay, so being willing to pay attention. Go ahead, Irma. For me, um, with Teddy and I, well, I've, I've gone through this season, elderly parents, sick parents, taking care of them, uh, really depending on that spouse to be there and support you. Uh, my mom came and lived with us for a year. Yeah. And that was really, really hard. And then, you know, losing her and then, Losing my dad and Teddy's parents are te were ten years younger than my parents, so now he's in the season of his parents. They're relatively healthy, but he was, you know, he his mom was in the hospital two days ago, yeah. and 
that's now it's my turn to support him. And so there's a lot of things that you're like, you make plans for, but you don't get to do because, you, you know, we take taking pair, care of our parents very seriously. Um, that's a command that God has given us. And there's something culturally that is expected of us. So right now, we're in that season still. Yeah. Go ahead. I feel like with um, anticipations go hand in hand with expectations and trying to meet those expectations your partner has for you. Yeah. So maybe I see the trash full and I go take it out without her saying anything. But, I mean, that's an example. <laughs> But us men are pretty stupid. We don't see the trash full. We walk right by it and probably pile another thing on it and don't even think it needs taken out sometimes. But like I said, work in progress. Yeah. But um, that's a small thing, but that can go as deep as, you know, emotional support. If your wife's hurting, us guys are that stupid. We don't know. And we all constant, it's a constant struggle for to dig down and try to be more observant and more aware. But yeah. Absolutely. Our nature is not to be caught up in emotions and to tuck those away. And my nature, anyways. I don't know if I speak for all males, but I try to put, try to hide emotion and and be tough and worry about work and providing and being strong. And sometimes you overlook the more important things. Now that you say that, it makes, so because he is that way, I think, I'm not going to say it's hardened me, but it makes it harder to give that physical, emotional love that men need as well. Because if, if he's not recognizing my emotional needs or my love that I need, I think I like get pretty good at just putting a wall up and just keeping my eye on the prize and that's our kids. So, you know, losing yourself and your children and work because I do all the bookkeeping for the farm. So having a balance is extremely important in your marriage. Um, so I'm going to give one more question and then we're done, okay? I, I, I know we've been here for a while, um, but I really wanted to end with this. Um, if you could give one piece of advice on marriage to, to a couple who, who is thinking about getting married or, or whatever it may be, what would that be? I'm going to give us... Three minutes. So I think our mistake when we got married was I wanted things my way. She wanted things her way. And it was a constant battle all the time. And if I can give you a recommendation to overcome that mess, when you get married, find a new way. And it's one that takes both of you into consideration and it's doing something that satisfies both and when we did that when we started doing things a new way guess what God was there and it was doing it his way and this new path of, of trying to meet both spiritual and physical needs with him as a center our marriage finally started flourishing we loved waking up to each other. We loved seeing each other. We loved being around each other. It changed. Yeah. So find a new way where both of you come together. Mm, that's good. So what about any of you guys? Go ahead, Jason. So one thing that, uh, that I would give advice to at least is uh, try to keep God's love center focused in your relationship. I found that um, whenever we do that, we are able to resolve conflicts easier. We're able to understand how each other feels better and and don't feel like you need to be perfect going into the relationship because both of you are from a broken world and so you you both are going to have your problems and issues and in that marriage you work on it together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was number one. I'm already. I'm kind of going through this with the kids. I ask them to find someone that they're evenly yoked with. I think that is extremely important to find someone that believes in God, loves God, and endures things through God, because that is where you're going to find your focal point of strength when you are married. 
Number two, I ask them, well, or I would ask you to have a lot of grace in your marriage because you are broken and, and God has given us enough, an abundance of grace that never fails. So grace is extremely important, forgiveness and grace. And uh, yeah. Sure. No matter how bad you think you have it, there's someone else that has it worse. That not only applies to marriage, everything. I mean, just being, I'm, no, no, this isn't us. This is, this is, well, let, no. Whatever problem you're going through, there's worse problems. You is what I'm saying. Hey, this is where, this is where men just need to put their foot in their mouths. Because what they're trying to say, it doesn't come out like they planned it to come out. But what I'm trying to, you know, you, you might find a problem. Oh, my husband's not around, or my wife's, my wife doesn't do this, or this, or this. Look at, look at. I can't help to to think about other people's situations and a dear friend of mine who's over here working, providing for his family, and then you know it just breaks my heart what he has to go through. So we talk about, oh, he didn't take out the trash, he didn't do this. Here's a man over here, you know, who's over here earning a living for his family that he can't even see his kid. I mean, you, you look at well, how other, what other people are going through and it puts your struggles and they, they seem this small. My Milan, Milan, you're a good man. We love you. Perspective is key. Absolutely. Roger, what do you got? Whenever I, uh, Decided I wanted to get married to Pat. I was a student at Harding University, and Dr. Neil Pryor was my Bible instructor. And I went and counseled with him about what I was doing. And he said, Well, the number one thing, make sure she's a Christian. And so, if I, any advice I could give to someone that's thinking about getting married, a solid marriage starts with who you choose. And that might mean you're in a relationship with someone that they're not, you don't think you're going to change a person from who they are. Yeah. They, that, that can happen. But if you start with someone that's already there, yeah. they can help you be better at it. Yeah. So choose the right person by first choosing to serve God. Yeah. And then recognize that marriage whether it's going to last five years, 10 years, 50 years, it is a work in progress and you're going to have to continue to work at it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one thing I, I learned um, quickly, I can't remember who told me, but you can't change anybody. The, the person, you know, they have to want to change first. And, and I think that's important for us to understand. And, and, God, and God works through and God can do amazing things. And, and God has done amazing things. You know, we're, I say these things and for each and every one of you, there's somebody here who, you know, you say, well, my spouse was this, but when we got married, God worked through that. And because of that, you know, we have this fantastic and amazing marriage, but that took time, right? And so, so you're right. You know, we, we've got, to, if you're getting into a relationship and saying, oh, well, they'll change. They can change. You, you don't have that power. I'm, I'm sorry. And so I think that's important. Um, we are way past time. So I want to say thank you guys so much for being willing to come up here um, and, and to put yourself through some embarrassment. So thank you. Um, Ryan, my office is open 10 to 5, <laughs> Monday through Thursday. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> well, church, um, you know, we would love to sit down and have a conversation. Maybe you're, you're working through your marriage right now and you're trying to figure things out, as we all are. And, and, and sometimes maybe you have that idea, you've got to walk this road alone. Well, that's the biggest lie Satan has ever said to you. And so my prayer is that in these next coming years, we can get out of this horrible statistical nightmare that we're in where it's one out of four people in churches are being divorced. Don't let it get there. Come have a conversation with, with one of us. All of our elders are here. That's why we're here. We're here to love you and to walk alongside you. 
um, you know, to Irma, Irma said something that I think is, is, so, is so important, is, is so many of us, we think, well, if we can just act like we're good, it'll be all right. Church, stop acting and start praying. And come, let us walk alongside you. We have resources here. We have people who, who would love to come and have a conversation with you and work through these issues and struggles with you. You do not have to do this alone. Work together as a team. The reason why I think this marriage series was so important is because church, marriage is important because God created marriage. And if God created marriage, he wants to see your marriage grow and thrive. 